It's Wednesday, the 23rd of August. Um, European equities are kind of hanging in there. Oil stocks are actually a little bit lower. Brent's getting uh, moved lower as well. The real story out of Europe today are the PMI data, which paints a pretty grim picture. We'll talk about it in a moment. The countdown to the close starts right now. The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. Healthcare is up, oil is down. That's the narrative out of Europe today. Uh, Roche with some really strong data on, on one of its new drugs. That stock is flying. It's up by 4%. Shell, BP, etc. Total, all tracking a little lower. Oil's been rolling over today. What that means basically is the stock 600 is fairly flat. We are up by four tenths of 1%. But we're waiting for NVIDIA. We're waiting for power. We're waiting for Lagarde. The PMI data today, though, paints a very bleak picture. And you're, you, you are wondering whether this kind of division this transatlantic divide that we see at the moment in equity markets will be perpetuated by the kind of numbers we've seen today, Alex. Yep, and I hate to say it, but it's the whole is bad news, good news when it comes to being long the equity market uh, and long bonds. And it seems like that answer is yes. We obviously see uh, the divergence in the U.S., but services is rolling over. Manufacturing and services, though, still above 50. So it's a different story when it comes to Europe. S&P up eight-tenths of 1%. The worst performing sector is energy, but it was down over 2%. We got inventory data uh, in the back out in the last hour. Um, diesel inventory really, really tight. You had a nice solid draw, particularly in Cushing, and that kind of helping support the index, even though the commodity uh, is still lower on the day. Talking about that big move in the bond market, but I have to say, it's not as big as that over in Europe. I really feel like it's European yields that are leading the way uh, for the U.S. What is interesting, though, is the Bloomberg dollar index rolling over just a touch, but the idea that if we have to change the narrative quickly, that the dollar could actually be that pain trade. The weaker dollar is the pain trade that can then shake out a lot of positioning. It will be very interesting over the next 72 hours in the Jackson Hole guy. Who knows? The narrative keeps changing. Is it about to change once more? Let's focus back on those PMI numbers. As you say, the, the, the numbers out of Europe are pretty grim. Certainly in real terms and in terms of what we were expecting, we knew the data were going to be bad. France was expected to come in at 47. It came in at 46.6. Germany, 48 to 44. These are the comp numbers. Eurozone, uh, 48, 47. That's the aggregate. We'll wait for the bigger number. This is the flash data, remember. UK, 50 to 47. That was actually one of the big surprises. Even the U.S. numbers, to be honest, Alex, are a bit of a surprise. 51.5 to 50.4, that was the forecast. That was the real number. We are seeing a slowdown mm. in these data. It, it certainly, I think, raises some interesting questions for Powell. I think it raises some really interesting questions for Christine Lagarde. Uh, absolutely. And how you talk around it and how long can you just stay data dependent when the data is painting a grimmer picture. So we spoke with Chris Williamson, the chief business economist at S&P Global Market Intelligence. It's his data on these PMI numbers. Uh, in, the, in the UK and Eurozone as a whole, the worst since 2013, e US stagnating. But it's a consistent with sort of stalled or 0.2, 0.3% of GDP contraction. So nothing mm -hmm. major at the moment. But if you keep hiking, these are going to get worse and you are going to get a Q3 downturn, feed through to a Q4 downturn recession. And that's going to hit confidence further and cause a deeper problem. Takes us to our question of the day. Do the PMIs point to a pause? Different central banks, I suspect, are reading the, the data we're seeing differently. Let's kick it around a little bit. Bloomberg UK Economy Editor Philip Aldrich uh, and Christine Aquino, Bloomberg Markets Today Managing Editor, joining us on set. Philip, if, if you're Christine Lagarde, if you're the governor of the Bank of England, you're looking at these numbers, does it, does it significantly change the narrative? Does it make the pause look much more attractive? The, the cracks are starting to form in some of these economies and they're getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I, it, it, obviously there is a... It, the central bankers don't want to have to tighten you know, to the point where they suffocate the economies, yep. these are their economies. So, um, you know... It, these data sets, these rather bleak economic outlooks that, we've, that you've just been talking about, do give them an argument to pause, which is definitely, um, for them, uh, what they've been looking for. But I mean, with the Bank of England, they've, been, they've basically been looking for a chance to pause since February, but it's, the data's gone against them the whole time. Mm -hmm. So this, I imagine they're jumping for joy. Uh, okay, jumping for joy. Christine, uh, are the central bankers going to do the same thing? 
<laughs> well, Alex, I mean, as far as the Bank of England is concerned, I mean, Philip and I were just talking the sidelines before we went on set. It is certainly favorable for their situation, right? Because they have long since indicated that they have wanted to pause uh, for quite some time. But, you know, the data that we've seen so far kind of pushed them in the direction of more rate hikes. I don't know if the same will apply to the Federal Reserve, though, because, again, uh, the message that we've gotten from Jay Powell and the rest of his colleagues is that they want to stay vigilant on inflation. They want to still have that message of talking tough about the need to bring inflation back down to target. And considering that the yep. U.S. has actually done the best in terms of bringing down their nominal inflation rate, uh, you know, th th that's quite interesting that they still want to keep that message along. And so I, I think it complicates, uh, the data complicates the, the situation for the Federal Reserve particularly, although it may be a relief uh, perhaps to the Bank of England and maybe even the ECB. I think, yeah, jumping for joy. We'll, we'll see whether they're jumping for joy. I'm just imagining the governor jumping for joy. Um, awesome. Let's talk about cuts. I, the data are accelerating on the, down, I, on the downside. This whole higher for longer narrative. If you, if, if you extrapolate these numbers and talk about, I, they, they point to a recession. I, not maybe a soft recession, but something maybe harder than a soft, a soft landing. Are these data, if we get a series of these data series, of these kinds of numbers, are we going to be back talking about cuts fairly soon? Well, interesting, though, Guy, that you mentioned that because we've actually seen quite the opposite, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, at least in the U.S., we have seen uh, those bets for a rate cut receding. Uh, and but what the, about in Europe? Yeah, in Europe, I mean, it's quite interesting because we haven't necessarily seen as much traction in terms of rate cut bets uh, as we have here versus in the U.S. Uh, and so, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense for a number of reasons, right? Because the Fed has been the most advanced in terms of delivering those rate hikes. Uh, it would make sense that markets are kind of of uh, uh, looking to the possibility of when that's going to turn sooner uh, and perhaps, you know, they delivered more than the ECB and, and, and the BOE and so it makes sense that markets also anticipate them to um, do as much in terms yeah. of rate cuts. But we haven't really seen the same magnitude yeah. and the same timing as in Europe and I think, you know, there's this kind of tacit um, uh, judgment by the markets that perhaps the BOE and the ECB really just don't have as much room as the Fed to do as much in way of rate hikes and really they haven't indicated the desire to do so. So th th this takes a question, Philip. It all comes down into the job market, right? So has this data that we're seeing the rollover in manufacturing and services actually trickled to the job market? Here in the U.S., Chris Williamson was saying, like, oh, sort of, but not yet. Like, we're kind of waiting for that moment. Maybe the hiring has stopped kind of thing. Well, what about over in Europe? Yeah, well, it's still, you know, it's still pretty hot, the jobs market in, in Europe, in the U.K. in particular. So... Uh, no, it's not. It's not showing up in like big falls in wages. In fact, rather the opposite. At the moment, this is the problem that uh, you know, central bankers and, um, and well, certainly in the UK, Andrew Bailey and his colleagues in particular have to get on top of uh, both services inflation, which is way above where they want it to be, and wages, which are growing far faster than is tolerable. So, uh, it, it, no, this this PMI data is. You know, it gives them an argument to make. They've, they've got to actually see the inflation data and the wage data and the jobs market yeah. basically easing up quite a lot for them to definitively be able to, to pause. But mm. you know, this, this is why they're jumping for joy, because at least they can start to make an argument, whereas before they've been sort of bounced into rate rises the whole yeah. time. All right, guys, great setup. Really appreciate it. Uh, Philip Aldrich of Bloomberg and Christina Kino, thank you so very much. Uh, coming up more on what the latest PMI data spells for monetary policy. Ralph Schlossstein, Evercore Chairman Emeritus, will be joining us next with his take on this and many, many more things. This is Bloomberg. Question of the day. Do PMIs point to a pause for central banks? It looks like the market is telling us yes. You're seeing a rally into the bond market, yields drop like a stone, the dollar coming off its highs, and you have a move into the equity market. So let's get the broader take. Ralph Schlossstein, Evercore Chairman Emeritus, joins me now here on set. Ralph, so good to see you. Thanks for coming in. It's great to see you as well. So what do you think? Does the data point to a pause right now? Well, I think uh, there's been encouraging data, both on the inflation front and on the uh, growth side. Uh, I, do, I don't think it will really affect what Powell says on Friday. 
Uh, I think what's probably going to distinguish him is what he doesn't say. Uh, I think he's not going to say uh, mission accomplished, mm -hmm. and I don't think he's going to be hawkish either. Uh, so I think he's just going to right down the middle. Right the down the middle. Uh, if there were a fairway in Jackson Hole, that's where he'd be. <laughs> okay. I, I like being right down the middle of the fairway. N like, never happens, but sounds like a really nice idea. Um, what does that mean for the markets, Ralph? I, the, the markets are anticipating to get cuts next year. Do you think he get those cuts? Is he going to disabuse us of the idea that we do get those cuts? Uh, I think the one thing that he could say that would affect uh, the markets is not necessarily it is longer. Uh, I do think we're going to have a period of uh, higher rates for longer. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's priced in the market yet. If he chooses to uh, say that, that will have a negative effect on the markets, but the market clearly is not anticipating that. What does higher for longer mean? Um, Bill Dudley had a piece out earlier this week. It was looking at the 10-year, but when you wrap in that fiscal deficits, term premium, you're looking at substantially 4.5% higher yields. What do you think we're going to sit I, with? I, I think we're uh, going to see... Uh, I, I don't believe the Fed is going to cut in the first half of next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think the economy still has a fair amount of strength. Uh, and because they uh, used the word transitory and got themselves into a deep hole, uh, I think they're going to be very careful not to uh, declare mission accomplished uh, too quickly. And I think they're prepared to take the risk. Yep of a mild recession uh, to, do that. to do that. Ralph, are we going back, though, to what we had before the pandemic, i.e. super low rates? Or are rates going to be more normal for the last 20, 30 years over the next 10 years? Yeah, I think the, the thing that, if you step back a little bit, the, we went through a 40-year period of time where rates were generally... Uh, declining, mm -hmm. longer rates, mm -hmm. uh, and they got extraordinarily low. Uh, I think that period of time has passed. So the bond bull dead. The bond bull is, I don't know if, you know, there'll be many bulls, huh. but there's not going to be that incredible systemic long-term uh, grinding lower uh, of interest rates. And I think that, you know, the all of uh, risk assets and all of investments have benefited from that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been in the last 40 years have kind of been the golden age of investing. Uh, and uh, I don't think we're going to have that for the next 10 or 20 years. So even Guy wasn't around before 40 years ago. He was around, <laughs> but like he, he, he was he in was, boarding he school. Was he was a wasn't gleam like... in his it, yeah. <laughs> mother's eye. Yeah. Oh, he, he was gleaming. All right, for sure. But so I, I guess for those of us who weren't around then, how do you make returns? Like, what's a good investment strategy? Because it feels like in some ways we're going to be very over-risked. I think, yeah, the, the biggest, uh, it's hard to, it's going to be harder to earn returns. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I had this discussion with uh, Larry Summers several years ago, and he was actually talking about the White House staff that I served on mm -hmm. under President Carter, and there were a lot of very successful people uh, on that staff, uh, present company not included, uh, <laughs> but people like David Rubenstein and mm -hmm. Frank Raines, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, he said, how did that happen? And I said, well, you know, I, I think if you look at it, we were all incredibly lucky to be in the prime of our work lives in the greatest period of broad wealth creation fueled by uh, rally and risk assets uh, in the history of the country. Uh, and so I think the, the way to make money in the next couple decades is probably is going to be in equities. Uh, but I personally am way overweighted in private equity because I think mm -hmm. their uh, pr private equity owners are more aggressive about addressing strategic or uh, human shortcomings in businesses hmm. than public companies are. Do, do, I, what do you think about private credit? What, what do, you, do you think private equity needs to make an adjustment to the higher rates era 
that we're potentially going to be going into? How far through that process do you think we are? They seem to be struggling a little bit in certain areas. There's a lot of portfolio companies out there as well that, that are going to struggle to make that adjustment as well. Do, do you think private equity is, is going to have a tough few years and then go back on, the, on, on track? Or do you think it's still on track right now? I, I think that there's definitely a, an adjustment going on right now. And uh, I think if you were a fly on the wall at any large private equity firm, uh, the, the discussion would center around we've got to get more liquidity for our investors, we've got to sell things, and the challenge is that uh, there's still a gap uh, fueled by uh, somewhat weaker multiples and by higher cost financing mm -hmm. between what sellers would like to get for their companies and what buyers are prepared to pay for them. So I appreciate that you know your few decade view is different than what we're going to see over the next 18 months. But do you think we're going to get into some kind of distressed debt cycle? Or with inflation getting stickier, is it a little different? It's, it's hard to imagine that we're not going to see Something. some stress. Uh, certainly, we're going to see stress in the uh, office, commercial, uh, mm -hmm. real estate, mm -hmm. debt market. Uh, yeah, which is a highly levered asset. Uh, and I think, you know, there are many companies that have pretty levered balance sheets. Now, offsetting that is the fact that you've got very forgiving capital structures. You know, the whole covenant light uh, structure uh, means that uh, the, the day of reckoning is uh, manana, 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 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but ultimately yep. it happens. Ralph, you got any AI tucked in that portfolio as well? Uh, I'm not smart enough, <laughs> artificially <laughs> or otherwise. So do you feel like the uh, NVIDIA uh, hype is hype or real, or you just don't no, want it's, to it's a, it's a real thing, mm -hmm. no question about it. But I think unlike, uh, you know, a NVIDIA it may very well be the exception, uh, but... Uh, First of all, I can't own any individual stocks because of my wife's job. So, uh, understood. So I, I own uh, indexes. She that's, does that thing in the UK. That's it. Uh -huh. Yes, she beats me up in the garden. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think you know the interesting thing about AI is that unlike the internet, where you have these incredibly powerful companies that were created, uh, you know the so-called magnificent. Seven, uh, I think the impact of AI is going to be much broadly, dis more broadly distributed in already existing companies. Uh, so it's going to affect every business, just like the internet did. But it's not clear to me that there, are, you know, other than the chip part, that there are going to be massive, you know, earth-changing companies created mm. as a result of AI. Mm. In terms of what do you do there, I, the, the equity story I think is fascinating. Equities, to what extent do you think equities are fair value now? Uh, do they have, if you, if you, why would I, if I'm in a 5% money market fund, Ralph, should I be coming out of that money market fund now and investing elsewhere? Or do you think the period of uncertainty you've kind of described a little bit, you should wait for that to work its way through, for the clouds to clear, for the uncertainty to, to maybe sort of dissipate a bit. This year has been, this year, it's been narrative after narrative after narrative, and that strikes me as being a signal of a market that is, that is at a pivot point, and the direction of travel isn't as clear as maybe we would like it to be. Yeah, I, I certainly am of that view. Uh, uh, what I don't have in index funds, I have in cash, uh, mm -hmm. and a, a lot of cash. So, uh, and I think uh, there's, there may be a bit of a head fake going on right now in the economy because you had, as a result of the pandemic, uh, massive, massive stimulus mm -hmm. uh, in this country. Uh, and, you know, well beyond what people could actually spend. So you had this incredible buildup of uh, excess savings uh, which is now being spent down and I think is kind of masking a little bit mm -hmm. the bite of the tightened uh, monetary 
policy. Uh, when that runs out, and I think we're within months of running out, uh, I think you're going to see uh, the bite of monetary policy, which has delays in any case. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we still have this sugar high from the pandemic stimulus that is masking a, what will likely be some weakness in this the economy kind of pushes me out to mid-2024, which incidentally is when we're going to see the presidential race really get underway. Yes. Do you think it's going to be Trump and Biden again? Uh, it certainly looks that way uh, today. Yeah. Although one could uh, certainly make uh, arguments uh, for uh, each of them not being there. Uh, but uh, the uh, Biden is clearly running. Uh, I think he's, you know, in good health mentally and physically and has every uh, intention of, of running. And I think he genuinely believes that if Trump is the opponent, he's the best qualified to take on uh, uh, former President Trump. And, yeah. and the Republican primaries are stacked very much in Trump's favor. You have 17 primaries that are winner take all and with 12 mm -hmm opponents, uh, you know, you can get an awful lot of delegates with a plurality of, of uh, votes in the primaries. Do you think the president's doing a good job right now? Do you think his economic policies are the right one? The U.S. economy seems to be supported on federal spending right now. And I'm wondering whether you think Bidenomics is, is the way forward. I, I think the president has actually had an incredibly productive two and a half years. Uh, you know, the, the recovery plan from the pandemic, the infrastructure plan, the CHIPS Act, uh, you know, these are all pretty remarkable uh, bipartisan accomplishments. I think the rallying the world in support of the Ukraine has, mm -hmm. uh, has been a, also a pretty remarkable accomplishment. Uh, Is there a risk, I, though, that all of that contributed to inflation, maybe more structural inflation? Well, definitely the, the last, uh, it's, it wasn't a dollop, it was a wave of stimulus, uh, definitely made a contribution to that. Ralph, you mentioned earlier that you served in the Carter administration and you were there with some of the brightest and the best. When the time comes, how should we, how should we remember President Carter? I think President Carter uh, will be remembered as by far our best ex-president. Uh, and that's not, he, he's a remarkably high integrity, high quality, intelligent man. Uh, honestly, having observed him for four years, he didn't really like politics. Uh, it's hard to be a great president uh, when you don't like politics. Uh, you contrast him with uh, the president who followed him, Ronald Reagan, who happens to have politics different from mine, but I think was an incredibly effective uh, president. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say that about uh, President Carter, but he's been a remarkable ex-president. Uh, mm -hmm. His charitable activities, his uh, involvement globally in uh, free and fair uh, elections, uh, you know, going out and building houses for Habitat for Humanity, you know, two years ago when he was 96. I mean, pretty remarkable. Yeah, I don't want to be doing that when I'm 96. I'm going to be uh, I'm, I'm sitting. I'm down not sure I could do that at my age. No, or, or my <laughs> my age. Uh, totally fair. I'm, I'm afraid I would hammer my finger rather than the nail. And then you'd really yeah. get yelled at in the garden by your <laughs> yes, wife. So exactly. th there would definitely be that. Um, yeah, we're all waiting for the next series of The Diplomats. Um, Ralph, I hear you're a Knicks fan, so, so I, you probably don't have a view on this. The, the Yankees losing nine in a row, is that something that warms your heart? Or are you, are you a little concerned no, about New uh, York City? I'm, I'm a born and bred Philadelphian, and so I root for every Philadelphia team except in basketball where I root for the Knicks because I'm... An incredible, I have every man's dream. I have every member of my family is a rabid fan yeah. of my favorite sports. So we all coalesced around the Knicks. Okay. But I get no, I, that sound, if I had to be for a Philadelphia, great. for a New York team, it would be the Yankees. So I'm disappointed. Okay. Ralph, I hear you're going to be in London soon. We'll see you then. Thank you very much. I look this forward to it, Guy.
Stocks finishing the day in Europe. We kind of bottomed a couple of hours ago. Since then, we've actually been rallying a little bit. Um, so a, a broadly positive picture, but only just really across most of Europe. The FTSE 100 seems to be having the best of it today. Uh, there's a little kind of FX translation effect that you want to kind of look at there as well. Some of the multinationals are trading a little bit stronger. Oil's been kind of a little all over the place. You have seen some weakness there, so that's been counteracting that. DAX is up by two tenths. CAC's absolutely flat on the day. So basically, Europe is going nowhere. We're waiting for NVIDIA. We're waiting for the, uh, for the Powell speech on Friday. We're waiting for Lagarde on Friday. The PMI picture today, pretty bleak. So that's the narrative today. Early morning, kind of a little bit more positive, a fade, and then a little rally in the afternoon as we come into the end of the day. So we're up by around four tenths of 1%. Single stocks, there's actually been some interesting stories today. Uh, Total, I brought up one of the oil stocks, as you can see, down by 1.85%. That's been the kind of the break on the market today. Uh, you've seen Brent rolling over. It's been reflected in some of the, uh, the energy names. Roche, good, good drugs data coming through. That's helped that stock out. So the healthcare sector's been one of the big outperformers in Europe today. The ripple effect from the other side of the Atlantic is clear in Adidas. Adidas, that stock down by 3.33%. This is, of course, the Foot Locker story. Foot Locker's getting crushed, but the ripple off the rock that that stock has thrown into the market today uh, has been significant. Maybe not a ripple, maybe a wave. Uh, and it's certainly reached European shores in the form of what's been going on with Adidas as well today. So that's the, that's the single stock story. Let's take a quick look at what the day ahead looks like. It's reasonably quiet. We're obviously going to be digesting NVIDIA first thing tomorrow morning. We're also going to be looking at French business and manufacturing confidence data after the PMIs. I think that could be interesting. Jackson Hole. I, I, honestly, I think we could all just sit and watch the view all, totally. all kind of over the last, next few days. Alex, the, the view is I, Mike McKee's hit, apart from the hat and the jacket and the shirt. Absolutely sensational. I think the real star is the, uh, is the backdrop. Uh, and then we're going to get to the Turkish Central Bank rate decision. Th the signal has been from the, the newly formed Central Bank that rates are going to be going up gradually. Now, does that mean, Alex, that we get 200 bips tomorrow? Do we get 250? And where is the ultimate direction of travel here? How far will we go? I think it's going to be really interesting to see what the messaging looks like tomorrow. Yeah, and if it does anything to really rev up support, um, uh, Turkish consumer confidence uh, plunged the most since President Erdogan came to power almost 20 years ago. So uh, the sentiment's not great. So joining us now uh, is Nilfar Sezgin, uh, chief economist at investment management firm Ish Portfoy. Um, Nilfar, thank you for joining. What do you expect the Turkish Central Bank to do tomorrow, and will it be enough? Yeah, thanks for having me. We expect the central bank to hike by 2.5 percentage point tomorrow, bringing the policy rate to 20 percent from 17.5 percent. Uh, as you mentioned, the central bank says that they are moving gradually. Last time they were saying the same thing and that brought us 2.5 percentage point hike. And this time we can again have another 2.5 percentage point hike in our view. The market consensus is also similar to our forecast. However, there are a significant number of economists who expect that the policy rate hike could be much lower, like one percentage point or 1.5 percentage point. Uh, considering that the central bank is over undershooting the market consensus over the last few uh, meetings, there is uh, obviously a risk that the central bank can deliver a lower interest rate hike. But um, let me say that the central bank governor uh, recently uh, gave us a view about yep. uh, where the interest rate hike could end up. And we believe that could be 30 percent by the year end. So in order to be at uh, 30 percent by the year end, we have to see 2.5 percentage point hikes in every uh, each and every meeting until the year end. Wow. Yeah, gradual, not too gradual. I, one one percent sounds very gradual. Uh, Exactly. In terms, of, in terms of what else they're doing, we're starting to see some macroprudential rules being brought in. We're starting to see some alternatives to rate rises being brought in in terms of financial regulation. To what extent are those stealth rate hikes as well? To what extent are they going to have a meaningful impact on this economy? Yeah. Yeah, considering that inflation is going to reach around 57% uh, in August, uh, up from 47% in July, and also considering that by the year end, we will be probably around 60%, and also considering that 12-month forward-looking inflation forecasts are at 42%, even if the central bank hikes by 2.5 percentage point to 20 percent or uh, to 30 percent by the year end, mm -hmm. that means that the policy rate will still be much lower compared to ex post or ex ante inflation. 
Uh, therefore, the central bank should definitely move on other measures like microprudential measures, which lead to higher interest rates charged on loans mm -hmm. and on deposits. And last time they did such a move at the interest, uh, MPC meeting, uh, on top of the interest rate hike, they introduced tightening macroprudential measures. Yeah. And we, prob we will probably see uh, similar moves this time. What is that, what is Erdogan, what will he let them do? In that, at some point, all of this is going to wind up hurting the economy in a different way, rather than higher inflation. So what's going to be that tipping point? Yeah. Uh, actually, I know that it's, it appears as if that the central bank is also paying a gr uh, big attention to growth and they are refraining from too much tightening in order to prevent growth slowing too much. However, if you look at what they did since July, uh, June, since they came to power, I mean the new governor is appointed, uh, they actually moved a lot. The interest rate charged on low, uh, loans moved up by more than 20 percentage point or even maybe 30 percentage point by some, yeah. uh, for some uh, loan categories. So I think they have done too much and I think they are paying attention not to growth but to financial stability because abrupt moves in interest rates would definitely have consequences, unintended consequences on the banking system's uh, health. Therefore, I think they are trying to balance the uh, tightening uh, yep. that is aiming to control inflation and uh, the financial stability. Neofar, does the market, though, believe that this is the new story for Turkey or that we go back to the one that we had previously in which we saw inflation going up but interest rates going down? Is there a belief that things have changed on a more medium-term basis? Yes, I think so, because the appointment of the minister himself, uh, the central bank governor herself, and her entire team, you know, that there have been lately very reputable names appointed to the Monterey Policy Committee. And I think um, they have uh, taken several tightening measures, very serious measures, which are intending to reverse what we did see prior to the elections. So I think they are moving very um, decisively. And I think this time it's going to have uh, different and more positive consequences on the foreign investors. However, let me note that we have elections again next year on uh, in March. This is going to be local elections. So it is very likely that uh, we can see some pause in the tightening uh, pattern of the central bank um, when we come close yeah. to the elections. But I think this is going to be temporary. And once the election is over, we will uh, go back to the tightening measures and more or orthodox measures. Nilfar, great to catch up. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Nilfar Sejgin, uh, Chief Economist at Ish Portfoy. Thank you very much indeed. We'll look for that decision tomorrow. European stocks have closed. A uh, little tick during the auction, but nothing really to write home about. Off the lows, the earlier lows that we saw, um, but nevertheless, uh, we're, we're kind of marking time in so many ways. The real story today has been in the bond market, the PMIs, certainly around Europe, setting off a little shockwave through the bond market. So we've seen a big bid coming back into bonds today. Equities in Europe, a little rally. Coming up, Republican presidential contenders, or at least some of them, facing off later. But of course, without the main contender, former President Donald Trump will look at the stakes in the first GOP debate of the primary season. That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. You are looking live at the principal room. Coming up, Omer Sharif, founder of Inflation Insights, joining Bloomberg Markets, The Close. That happens at 2 p.m. in New York, 7 p.m. here in London. This is Bloomberg. Biden is clearly running. Uh, I think he's, you know, in good health mentally and physically and has every... Uh, intention of of running and I think he genuinely believes that if Trump is the opponent he's the best qualified to take on uh, uh, former President Trump and, yeah. and the Republican primaries are stacked very much in Trump's favor. That was, of course, Ralph Schlossstein, Evercore Chairman Emeritus, speaking to Alex and me just a few moments ago. 
Talking about what is happening with the debate that is coming up, the Republican presidential candidates, or at least some of them facing off in their first debate this evening, of course, notably absent from the stage, will be Donald Trump. Bloomberg's Kayleigh Lyons joins us now from Washington. Kayleigh, if I want to get a handle on what is happening here, do I watch the Tucker Carlson interview with Donald Trump? I think it's pre-recorded. Or do I watch this debate? Which of these two are going to be the bigger draw? Well, this is the big question for Republican primary voters, because obviously the former president, who is far and away the front runner, he is leading in national polls by 40 plus points, is trying to counter program Fox here by speaking to Tucker Carlson, a former Fox host, and airing that interview, which was indeed pre-taped exactly at 9 p.m. Eastern time, which is when the debate starts on Fox. However, the question is going to be which is going to bring more substance, substantive policy conversation. The moderators of the debate tonight have said they really do want to focus on policy. Yes, Trump is going to be an unavoidable uh, topic. We understand they're going to be using sound bites from the former president and some of their questioning to the other candidates. But theoretically, there's going to be deeper policy substance from these other eight individuals or possibly seven, depending on whether or not North Dakota, North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum actually can uh, do the debate because we understand he went to the emergency room yesterday yesterday after getting injured playing uh, pickup basketball. But things like the economy, China, Ukraine, in theory, will be the bigger focuses of conversation. So, Kaylee, I mean, I think the Fox News, they're playing sots from Donald Trump. Like, I mean, they're definitely clearly, yeah. like, featuring him in some capacity. I'm trying to get a handle, too, on, like, who, who's it to win or lose? Usually when you go into these things, the spin or the, the path of the spin is clear. I have no idea what the spin world is going to look like after this. Well, the spin world... Surely will be quite chaotic, Alex, but really Ron DeSantis is going to be the focal point here. He is quite literally going to be in the center of the stage because he is the highest polling among the eight individuals uh, that will be debating tonight. Of course, that still puts him 40 plus points behind uh, the former president, but he really is looking like he is in second place position at least for this time. And that means, and he has said this himself, he is likely going to be the target of a lot of attacks tonight. And this is being billed as something of a make or break moment for his campaign as he has seen a deterioration. Deterioration yep. in the polls, also a dwindling cash pile and a reset of his campaign that really to this point hasn't taken hold just yet. Kenny, let's talk about Virginia. If it doesn't go well tonight for all of the candidates, <laughs> does Glenn Yonkin take a look? Is it, is it going to be enough for him to persuade him to maybe enter the race? I, what, what is it going to take? This is a really interesting question. We know he has been encouraged by some in the Republican Party and even has met with the likes of Rupert Murdoch over the course of this summer who have been encouraging the Virginia governor to perhaps take a look at running. We haven't really heard anything definitive from him to that effect, but we are working against a clock here. Obviously, it is still early. It's August 2023. We have until November of 2024. But by this fall, he would need to be registered to appear in all of these different early primary states. So it's going to be decision time coming up here pretty soon. But to your point, Guy, if no one looks like they really gained material traction at the debate tonight, no one looks like they could appear uh, able to counter Trump uh, in this Republican primary, then maybe it would make the case more for another late entrant or perhaps a third party to come into the picture. You know, Kelly, um, in, in talking over, over time to previous Trump supporters who have serious money that are willing to put money into the race, they support various primary candidates, but they say at the end of the day, I'll still back Trump if, if it comes to that. How, uh, are you hearing a lot of that, too? Because I'm just wondering, like, how much money can really be raised after these debates when it feels like a lot of the money is like, yeah, OK, if I want a Republican, then it's Trump's the, the nominee. Oh, yeah, I guess I'll just support him anyway. Well, this is a real question for a candidate like Ron DeSantis, who initially was attracting a lot of those big money donors who have since started to hold back on actually supporting him because he hasn't been able to gain that much traction. And those dollars could find a home somewhere else. But someone like Senator Tim Scott of, of South Carolina, uh, who is actually gaining some momentum in the polls as well, also has been able to attract some of those bigger money do donors. It seems that Wall Street likes him, so he could be an attractive place to put the dollars. But to your point about if it is Trump, the support will be thrown there. This also comes back to the issue of the pledge that the RNC made each and every candidate sign that they would support the eventual nominee, no matter who mm -hmm. it, it would be, the RNC billing it as a beat Biden pledge, not necessarily a pro-Trump pledge. Great stuff. Kaylee, thanks a lot. Super appreciate it. Kaylee Lyons, thank you very much. Looking forward to the coverage after the debate. And tomorrow we're going to have an interview with Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley. That's coming up at 1030 a.m. in New York time, 3 p.m. in London. So stay with you, us for that. All right, coming up, the U.S. Treasury auctioning 20-year bonds later on today. There are some key levels to watch. This is Bloomberg.
stocks just, you know, staying stuck right around the highs. The Nasdaq 100 up by 1.5%. Impressive because you have NVIDIA coming uh, after the bell as well. Abigail tracking some of these moves for us. Abigail. Impressive indeed. And it's not just the session highs on the day, Alex. We're also looking at the session highs on the week. When's the last time you can remember this, that on a third up day, uh, we are at those session highs up 2.9%. Well, I can give you the answer. These are the best three days for the Nasdaq 100 going back to the middle of July. So we have a little bit of a relief rally. This, of course, is yields are down sharply, sharply on the day. Some of that uh, bad news out there supporting the idea that maybe the Fed uh, will be done. We don't know that for, of course, but it is helping out big tech stocks. If we take a look at what's moving beneath the surface, we are going to see lots of green on the screen for our well-known tech names. Apple up 2.1 percent, Meta uh, up closer to 3 percent, NVIDIA. And this is interesting because, of course, yesterday NVIDIA was sliding uh, today up 2 percent ahead of earnings. That last quarter was incredible when the stock rallied by, I think it was 100 and nearly $200 billion. It was the largest single one-day move from a market cap perspective for any stock after they raised their revenue guidance by 50 percent to just above $11 billion. The question is, can they do that again? Will AI uh, support that kind of a repeat? And not to be left out, Microsoft. Now, as for NVIDIA, not surprisingly, this stock is not for the faint of heart. It is up more than 200 percent on the year, and it has a history of volatility around its last earnings. So uh, back in the fall of last year, uh, options were uh, implying a roughly 10 percent move or so. The stock fell 17 percent. Then uh, earlier this year, uh, looking for about a 6 percent move, the stock was up about 8 percent. Now, this monster quarter, the expectations had, were a little bit muted, looking for a 5 percent move up or down. Again, that 18 percent move higher. Guy, take a look at this. Investors are looking, options are implying uh, that we could see a 10 percent move up or down for NVIDIA. But I would suggest that the last three quarters point to the idea it could be an even bigger move up or down. All eyes on 4 p.m. today. Yeah, and what is interesting here as well is that calls are still more expensive than puts. It tells you about the optimism that still exists around this stock. The bar's high. Can it clear it? Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Um, what are we watching for the rest of the day? Clearly, NVIDIA is going to be front and centre, but we get Snowflake, we get Splunk. We also get the Republican presidential contenders facing off at 9 p.m. New York time. The first debate, that's going to be fascinating. And Alex as well, don't forget that Treasury auction as well. We get 20 years coming at 1 p.m. New York time. Yep, looking forward to that. Also, side note, apparently tomorrow is usually the sickest day of the year when most people call out of work for various reasons. So, you know, look ahead to that. Know that as you're working with your colleagues. So let's get more, though, on those auctions. The 20-year coming uh, at 1 p.m. Bloomberg's Michael McKenzie uh, joins us now. What should we be looking for? What's the takedown, you think? It's going to be the, ultimately how, how much demand there is from investors. We've seen a big backup in yields this month. We've seen concerns about the bond market regarding a stronger economy than people thought. We've seen the fact that um, inflation may be stickier than people thought. And also we've got Jackson Hole on Friday where there is some expectation that uh, Jerome Powell will talk about the idea of the neutral rate, the sort of the policy rate that doesn't slow or let the economy expand is actually higher. It's actually higher than that 2.5% long-term target the Fed has held in place. So as a result, long-end yields have risen, uh, yep. performance has fallen, and investors are now going to ask themselves, is there enough of a concession, as they call it, in that 20-year to encourage some good demand? The, the short-term concession. But, but is there a belief, Michael, that the term premium is high enough yet? That, that seems to be the ongoing question about whether or not we're getting compensated enough at the back end. That's the trillion dollar question, Guy. I mean, everyone I, talk, I talked to in the bond market is wrestling with this question right now. What is the term premium? I mean, it's still negative if you look at the New York uh, Fed's model for 10 years. People believe that should be positive. And we're actually in the beginning of the early stages of a return back to what we had pre-global financial crisis. Uh, so then to that point, can we just talk about technical levels for a second? Like what, I'm, maybe not doesn't apply as much to the 20 year, but for the 10 year, for example, like what are the key levels we're now watching? We push past that. We're going to have some more upside for a while. Yes. So I think a lot of people talking about a 450, 460, 10 year. People like Dominic Constant, for example, um, talk about, you know, that the door is open to sort of yields sort of pushing that in that direction. But at, at the end of the day, though, people are having to come back to, okay, the Fed is close to being finished in terms of tightening. The real question is, how long are they going to stay on hold for? Is inflation going mm -hmm. to slow and moderate enough to allow them to start to cut rates next year? The bond market has been consistently pricing in a lot of rate cuts over the next 12 months. That trade has not really worked for bond traders. Um, and in turn, it means the longer the Fed is on hold, 
the higher rates stay yeah. and it means long end rates stay high too. All right, Michael, thank you very much. Looking forward to that in just a couple hours, oh, one hour actually. Uh, Bloomberg's uh, Michael McKenzie joining us there. Thank you very much. Um, okay, well, Guy, we made it through today. I'm trying to make a pivot back to giraffes. I don't have one. You got, I, you honestly, have one? today has been one of those days. Well, no, just think about it. There, there's, there's a few things that you don't see very often today. A, Mike McKee in a cowboy hat. I'm not sure you're going to see that again. Uh, obviously, out competed by Alex Steele in her hat, the cowboy hat that we saw when, it was, when you were in Oklahoma. A, and a giraffe with no spots. I, I think there's got to be some market messages in, in this. Maybe, maybe it's a signal about AI. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can kind of extrapolate... The background at, at, at Jackson Hole as well looks AI generated. It feels like there's a lot of kind of AI like events taking place here. I can't work out. Uh, Is the giraffe real? Uh, yeah, okay. So we need to talk about the story for a second. So apparently there was a female giraffe without spots that was born on July 31st in Tennessee. Um, this is the only animal in the world right now that doesn't have a spot if you're a giraffe. So this is like super, super rare. And usually spots are used to help camouflage a giraffe in the wild. So like, I don't know, is this climate change? Like what is the evolutionary thing of not having spots? No, I, yeah, I don't know, but, but you don't see it very often is my point. And I, I just think it just kind of points to what is happening. I Yankees, don't know. Yankees. Maybe I'm extrapolating. No, no, Yankees on the, the uh, Yankees, streak? the yes. Yankees. Look at that. You don't see that very. 1913 was the last time they lost 10 games in a row. We're at nine. Yeah. Feels like there's some pretty epic events taking place right now. Yeah, the Yankees are in a really tough spot. It doesn't look so good. Anyway, on that note, guys. Alex Steele talking up. about sports. I, I've been to Yankee games. I do. I, I do like baseball. All right. Anyway, that wraps it up for me and Guy. Uh, coming up, Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ned Ludlow. This is Bloomberg.